I want to talk about grace today. I love this message. I just pray that God, this will not be, I, I'm not interested in more head knowledge in the Western church. We've got more head knowledge in the Western church than, you know, I think in history began. You know, I, I know people who can't read and write who just went to a few seminars with someone like T.O. Osborne and planted churches all over the place. I mean, it's what you, it's when we, we do something with what we got. Amen? Yeah. The Bible says if we just hear, but we don't do anything, we actually become deceived. Can you get that? But if we get it in our hearts, in our spirits, God will, uh, it will, it will change us. And so I'm just going to pray, and I just pray, Father, in the name of Jesus right now, that you will release your spirit of wisdom and revelation, Lord, that you will open the eyes of our hearts. I pray, Father, that, Lord, what I share today about your, the power of your grace will not just go into our heads, but will go into our hearts. And that there would be a total transformation of how we see ourselves in Christ, how we see one another, and how we see this lost world. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Turn with me to 2 Samuel 9. Do you know, before David became king, we all know the story that David and Jonathan um, made a covenant together. Did you know that? I'm sure you would have heard that. And, and, and actually, when they made that covenant, it says they made it between themselves and their descendants. And so these two leaders, as it were, were coming together. And once you make a covenant, it's not like a contract. I think the church, as we understand covenants, we will get such a revelation of God's heart. You know, a Chelsea football manager has a contract. But how many people know that can be broken at any time? God has a covenant that can never be revoked. Yeah. Wow! And so when David and Jonathan made that covenant, that was not only for them, Jonathan insisted, it would also be to their descendants. And so when David became king, he, one of the things he did in 2 Samuel 9, he said, Is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And one of the servants said, Well, there's this guy, and I'm going to pronounce him once, and maybe that will be enough, because no one else I know can pronounce this guy's name. Meshivishef. Just say Meshivishef. Well, you can't say it either, so that's okay. There's Meshivishef, who is the son of Jonathan, verse 6. And uh, they, David said he's in Lodibar, which is a lonely place. A place of desolation. Do you know, Meshivishef probably hated David. When David, when Saul's reign ended, it says, John, this, this guy's nurse picked him up as a young child, but fell, and he fell on the floor, and he was a cripple for the rest of his life, because he was fleeing from the presence of David, because he must have thought, David's going to come in, and he's going to liquidate everyone connected with Saul. And he would have hated God. It's amazing, isn't it? That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and loved us. Isn't that amazing? He loves that person out there just as much as he loves you and I. Wow. And, and then it, and, and it, he, he was ushered into the presence of David. And he must have thought, this is it. It was good while it lasted. It's coming. And then David said, fear not. Fear not. For I will show you kindness. Why? For Jonathan, your father's sake. I'm going to restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, 
and you will eat continually at my table. That is about as close as you can get to adoption. There's going to be Solomon and Tamar, all of David's sons. And then at the same table, there's going to be this cripple. Why did he do it? Why did David bless someone who probably hated him to begin with? He wanted to bless Mephibosheth because he saw every time he looked at this man, he saw the covenant he had with Jonathan. And the blessing that he would have longed to give to Jonathan, he was going to give to the descendant of Jonathan. Do you see that? He was blessed because he was in Jonathan. He was in that line. And Jonathan's blessing was his blessing. Now the Bible tells us that the gospel is a gospel of grace. That's what Paul called it. A gospel of just forgiveness would be like this. Someone came to my house, stole, I don't know, is there anything worth stealing, Daniel, in my house? I'm trying to think. Yeah, stole the television, just about worth something. Ran down the street. I caught them. I was about to minister the fivefold ministry. <laughs> and then I realized I'm a Christian. I take my television back. I let them go. <laughs> that would be the gospel of forgiveness. The gospel of grace would be... I caught them, I took my television, and then I said, hey, why didn't you come and live in my house as one of my sons? Do you see that? God didn't just deal with the negative. He washed away our sin. He gave us grace, what we could not deserve, what we could not earn, what we could not get for ourselves, he gave us an incredible favor. And you, you know, in the Old Testament, if you, if you said, I'm the son of God, they would have taken you outside the city and stoned you to death. In the New Testament, we're not just servants of God, we are sons. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. We do not, um, and you are a joint heir with Christ. Everything he has, he is going to share with you. You reign with him. Amen. Yum, yum. Amen. Is that okay? Yes. I'm kind of happy about that. And so he didn't just wipe away the sin. He said, you're coming in. You're my child. And I am going to bless you. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Every promise of God is yes and amen. amen. How do you see yourself? You see, you're not blessed because of what you do. <coughs> You are blessed because you are in Christ Jesus. Meshivashev was not blessed because he's Meshivashev. He's blessed because he was in the line of Jonathan. And as much as David would have blessed and given Jonathan, he gave Jonathan to Jonathan's son. Wow. It's kind of interesting he was crippled. In those days, thank God that we have things that uh, people disabled or physically restricted can do. We have more computers. We can, you know, we have all the bells and whistles. Like they say, the only difference between the men and the boys is the price of their toys. He says preaching off an iPad. But you know, he couldn't have really done anything. Couldn't have fought in the war. Couldn't have tended to the land. He was crippled. But David said, because of my covenant with Jonathan, I'm just going to lavish you. Wow. 
You see, Christianity doesn't start with what you do. It starts with what he has done. Receiving it. Receiving it deep in the core of your being. And Jonathan must have been like Peter when, when, when Jesus tried to minister to Peter and wash his feet. He said, no, 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 I can't take this. No, 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 no. Too much, too much. And Jesus said, you have to receive it. Do you see that? You've got to receive grace. Do you know what your Christian responsibility is to this city? To receive every blessing from God that he died on the cross to give you. To absorb it into every aspect of your life. To walk it out in this city so that people who look at you go, what is it you've got? Amen? Yum, yum. You see, verse 16 of Romans 5. Sorry, verse 17. If by one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Who's that? Come on, saints. Adam. I'm going to have a chat with Adam. Yes. When we get to glory. Do you know what you did? For millions of people. For over 2,000 years. No, 6,000 years. So I get so focused on the cross. And it says this. One offence, for, for the judgment came through the one offence resulting in condemnation. But the free gift came from many offences resulted in justification. If by one man's offence death reigned through the one, say death reigned. How much more or much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will what? Come on, saints, are you with me? You will reign in life through the one Christ Jesus. Verse 19, for by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience... Many will be made what? Righteous. Righteous. Now you're going to start. Did you, what did you do to be in Adam? Come on. Did you have to pray the Adam prayer? <laughs> you just got it. You were born into a fallen world. You didn't even have to receive it by faith. It just came your way. <laughs> I've got a little son and I'm, I don't have to train him to be bad. <laughs> it, it just kind of comes. <laughs> I'm training him in righteousness. You didn't do anything. And you were, the Bible says, by nature, by identity, a sinner. Now we all know that and we, most preachers have no problem in telling people that. But I've got news for you. You are not, by identity, a sinner. Hello? You have been declared a saint. You have been given a gift of righteousness. And you are a saint who may sometimes sin. But you have a different identity. And the more you know your identity, how God sees you, it says the gift of righteousness. Mm. That affects how you pray. I don't come before God like a Pharisee and say, Lord, I preach the gospel in all these nations. Lord, I work for you. I do all these great things. And oh, I'm amazing. So you have to let me into your presence. Hello? It says, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Do you see that? What did you do to be in Christ? It's very simple. You received his gift of righteousness. I'm a nobody, I'm just a smelly, dirty, awful sinner. God hates me. Really? 
You are in Christ. And he says, I have clothed you in righteousness. Amen? Amen. You see, Prince William was, is, and was who he was when he was a baby in his mother's arms. Did he know that he was going to be a, a, an heir to the throne? Did he know that he could potentially be a king in this country? No, he just looked up, those little eyes, looked at his good-looking mom and go, you know, feed me. <laughs> but he was all of those things from the moment he was born. Your Christian life, who you are in Christ, you got the very second you made Jesus your Lord and Savior. Wow. And all you're doing now is this an unveiling of who I am. You see, I'm not, it's not you trying to be something. It's you being who you already are. You know, Prince William isn't walking around going, I've got to really try and be a prince. Hello? He's not really trying. Oh, I've got to. He just knows his identity. And unlike Prince Harry, bless him, <laughs> is walking in his identity. Do you know, if you pray to God, oh God, I'm just a, oh, just an awful, terrible, how can you come with me? I am just such a useless. You are denying the work of redemption. And you are squandering the blood of Jesus. Hello? Uh, and some Christians have this sort of penance that they do. They're like the prodigal son. He said this when he, when he ran from his father and he came back. And he said, look, make me like one of the servants. I'm going to work my way back into sonship. The father wouldn't have it. He said, now that you've repented, I'll put that robe on you. A robe of righteousness. Amen. Wow. We don't, some, you know, some charismatics say, like, you know, I don't know what it's like in your church, Pastor John, but, you know, when someone messes up, they always, if you're on the back row, it's not you, okay, they always come on the back row, and then gradually they work their way forward, and, uh, and then they don't, you know, they don't want to do anything in the church, but then after a couple of weeks, they, you know, a couple of months, they, they start doing something again. Listen, the blood of Jesus has paid it all. And if you have something, the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace where we find grace and favor and help in a time of need. You see, the, it's exactly the opposite. Human, re, human reaction is this. We run from God. God is saying, if you're backslidden today, if you messed up this week, don't run away. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Sometimes I say to Silas, what are you doing? This is my son. What have you got in your hand? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> and then eventually, he comes and gives it to me. Come before him. Let him do it. And if you understand grace, then you understand, hey, I didn't do this. I don't deserve this. It changes everything. It says this. You see, you could look at redemption in two ways. You could say, you either get it through obeying every dot and tittle of the law. Anyone want to volunteer? <laughs> Jesus said this, until heaven and earth pass away, not one dot, not one tittle of the law will pass away. The law hangs over humanity. And James 2.10 says this, if a man's trying to justify himself through the law and he fails once, so you live perfectly, sinlessly, from the moment you were born to this very moment today, but you, I don't know, you swore at the parking lot. You've lost it. You can't stand before God who is holy. Do you get that? So I, 
I, I reckon that, and that's why Jesus said this, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. What you could not do, what David could not do, what Abraham could not do, what Moses could not do, who even got the law, he couldn't do it either. God did on your behalf. Wow. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yum, yum. I couldn't do it. The law, it says in Romans, has declared the whole world guilty. That's why when, you know, you talk to people and they say, I'm not good enough to be a Christian. My answer is this, nobody is. You can give 10 pounds to the Salvation Army every week, but you're still not good enough. You see, but Jesus said this, I came to fulfill it. It's like this, there's the marathon of the law. Not one person could fulfill that marathon. And Jesus won the marathon. And what did he do? He took the winner's medal and he put it round your neck. The righteousness of God. Yay! Woohoo! Now just imagine, just imagine for one moment, you had never sinned or broken, and by the law, I'm not just talking about the Ten Commands, I'm talking about the whole um, law of Moses. There's hundreds. Ceremonial law, civic law, and so on. I'm talking about the whole thing. But just imagine you fulfilled it all. This morning, today, from the moment you were born to now, you had fulfilled the law perfectly. How do you feel? Now, you've got to be careful because you're going to fall into pride, right? So, but you would feel pretty good, right? Yeah? yeah? Hello? You'd be, you wouldn't be walking around London going, woe is me, I'm a sinner. You'd be walking along in tune with your creator. Hello? But I've got news for you. In Christ, that's how he sees you. The gift of righteousness. Wow. So let's just say, this is you and this is Christ. When you came and believed in him, you came into Christ Jesus. And when he sees you through that blood, he sees you in Christ. Mm. I was talking about this on Thursday night, and someone said, well, why don't we get this message out? How, how come we don't get this out to, to the non-Christians? I said, that's exactly the response I want. He did what you could not do. In the Christian life, you start at the end of the race. Complete in him. Wow. Woo! Now there's a journey of sanctification. There's a journey of learning who God says you are. There's a journey, uh, there's, a, there's a process of transformation more and more into the image of God. But in terms of how you stand, you stand in his righteousness. And that affects everything. It affects how I work. It affects how I look at other believers. It affects how I look at the lost. Oh, I want to be someone that knows, that lives in the grace of God. You see, Mashibashif must have thought, I don't, I can't take, this is, he's, he, how can he do this? I, I hated him. You need to learn to receive. Let me tell you, when you are in Christ, as we saw, this will throw you. As much as the father loves his son, as much as David loved Jonathan, and that love went to the descendant of Jonathan, so the father loves you, his son, his daughter. Wow. Jesus said this to his, he said to the father, that the love that you have given me may be in them. The Bible says this, we love him because he first loved us. One of the things we are trying to teach our people, 
learn how to receive that incredible love that Paul described as so wide, so deep, so high, so broad. That love that surpasses human knowledge. Know that you're loved. Paul said this. Galatians 2.19 For through the law I died to the law that I might live for God. Which side of the cross are you living on? You see, if you have a law-based mindset, it's like this. A law-based mindset is like this. Is, is like, you know, you say, what right, God, what do I have to do to be a good Christian? How many hours a day do I have to read my Bible? How many hours do I have to pray? Imagine if I went to my wife the day before we got married and said, Honey, I want to be a good husband. How many hours do I have to spend with you? <laughs> Hello? Hi. How much do I have to give you? It's, it's like, you know, 200 quid a week, all right? Or, you know, <laughs> what, do you, what do I have to do? You see, the, the Pharisees... They were legalists that lived in the negative. They were so worried about the requirements, they would tithe the leaves of the trees in their gardens. And when you think like that, it's all selfish. Do you see that? You're worried about, am I right? What, have I done enough of this? Have I done enough of that? Have I done enough of the other to be right with God? But Paul said this, I have died to the law. Okay, I've died to trying to fulfill requirements because now I have received God's righteousness. I have received God's gift and I stand in Christ complete. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now he said, I have, I, I see myself in Christ. He did what I could not do. So now what do I do? I can live for God. Amen. You see, if you spend your whole Christian life like, am I good enough? Oh, oh my, I'm not as good as, oh man, oh. You're going to live in defeat. What you focus on will manifest in your life. You focus on your failure, you will always fail. Focus on him and how he sees you and who you are. Be a prince. I'm with the royal family this afternoon. Hey, I'm privileged. Hey, we're in the house of God. We're in the family of God. That's the church. 